because I have a four-year-old and he's started to see some in his uh, his little devotional books. He sees kind of cartoon Jesus right. hanging on the cross, and he'll, yeah. well, why is he up there? What? Why did those bad people do that to him? And he's totally. he's asking what a four-year-old typically asks, but not realize right. he's, he's he's asking deep theological questions. He's sure. even asked, how come his skin is darker than mine mm. is? And I, and that's I a new think, that's a new thing, by the way. Yeah, it, it used to not be. Well, I thought <laughs> flannel graph Jesus had the same skin color as I do, right. but uh, he had bluer eyes. Yeah, <laughs> but when we're actually doing this accurately. And so I thought, you know, that there's one conversation there about, right. well, Jesus grew up in a different place. And I thought, but he's asking, why did those bad people do that? Why did those bad people kill them, kill him? And yeah, I have a degree in theology, so I feel sure. like I can answer that. If his friends were over and they're talking and I feel like I can do that. I want my friend, his friend's parents to be able to do that too. Right. But like you mentioned, we have some parents that they may see a lamb and think, oh, you guys learned about farm animals today. Uh, great. Right. They cool. don't have a clue. Or what do you mean you put blood on the door? What does yeah. that mean? You're like, what kind of crazy people yeah, put blood on the door? Yeah, let's get you away from right, here. Right. So I'm wondering, for, for those parents, mm-hmm. what message of hope and encouragement can you offer to them, to the parents, to the churches, who want to begin implementing Deuteronomy 6, but they're really timid and fearful about doing it? I, I think, well, it's hard because there's a learn a little bit of a learning curve but it goes so fast that once they cl- once they see it like once you see a family all get baptized together it solves it for everybody i mean it's like there are people who say no kids need to be silent you know and i and then we got up i had to get up almost every week and say this church is for the kids like if they don't if they don't think it belongs to them then we did something wrong i had to say that over and over and over and and we had a bunch of people leave i mean they were you know they were like um, we don't like that the kids, we had a little girl come up for communion. Uh, she just took the thing right off the top, drank it. But before we even did it, she just walked up, took it like a snack. And somebody was like, it's not fishy crackers. This is like the Lord's body. And I was like, I said, but when Jesus had meals, did he stop the kids? And they were like, I don't know. So I don't know how Baptists do it, but, uh, but for us, because it's Passover, I can't even imagine not letting kids be a part of it. So it becomes this thing of like, that throws everybody off now. Cause they're going, well, I mean, could you imagine, I don't know if you've ever done a Passover Seder, but there's like four cups. Could you imagine halfway through the meal? You were like, okay, so for this part, kids, you need to cross your arms and receive a blessing, but you can't participate. Like that's so foreign to me. Hmm. Like this idea that they can't be a part of it in any way. Now I understand the solemnness of it, but do this in remembrance of me. Well, what's the, this, to me, it's the meal that Jesus had with his disciples that represents the entire theme of the Bible, which brings you back to essentially uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy, right? So when you're reading the Bible as one story, all of a sudden you're going, well, what's the role? So what happens is, is that we had to tell people that you could adopt each other too, because when you start talking family, uh, single people get nervous, people who like widows and orphans, essentially, it's literally like the Bible says, they get really like, yeah, but... I see the dad over there with his arm around his wife and praying over his kids, but where do I belong? Mm, and you almost yeah. have to redefine it because, so we started saying, listen, if you are a grandparent, like you need to adopt some grandparent stuff, like be grandparents to the kids. Like you know how to do that and try to get them to do it. Now it's dangerous because you get some people who you kind of think, man, I wish they wouldn't say stuff to the kids, <laughs> you know, but you have to, so then you have to deal with it differently. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I think it has the benefit has been so crazy to watch them over because this is really kind of new for us too, and uh, really trying to implement it like in our actual service. Um, but I'll tell you this: we baptized two people in the last ten years, and since we started doing family ministry, we baptized thirty. Mm. I mean, it was like, and it was like, and these are people who are going, and it's all because their families involved and. You know, and we're seeing like grandparents, like teenagers, kids, like the whole thing. Like they're all like, yeah, that's what I want. Um, it started off messy, though. And, and it still is. I mean, because family is messy. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but look, I mean, Jesus washed feet. Why did he wash their feet? Because everybody's messy. So to me, it's like if we're get, if you can even like I was just talking to somebody and I'm going to steal their example. But they said you can either have a like a donkey in the barn or an empty barn kind of thing like you, you can have an empty room. It can be very clean, but you, I don't think you can do church clean. And mm-hmm. I think people want it to be clean, but it's, I don't think it works that way.